Thank you, Kenny, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so as you can probably see there, um, I'm going to be talking about my new book, um, Birds and Flowers, an Intimate 50 Million Year Relationship. Um, it was published in Europe in uh, the end of um, February, um, sorry, mid-February, and I, I believe it comes out in North America uh, at the beginning of March, possibly mid-March, uh, but it's available from all of the usual places where you would you would uh, buy books. Um, so I'm going to be. That's a focus of my my talk today is is the book, and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about what's in there, uh, but also how it relates to, of course, the topic that you're interested in, uh, which is uh, evolutionary science. Um, so I'll. I'll Begin with just saying a little bit about who who I am. Um, I am an independent uh, consulting scientist uh, and an author, uh, and the focus of my work is on understanding ecology, evolution, and conservation of pollinators and the plants that they're associated with. Um, and I'm currently living in Denmark. I'm coming to you from Denmark at the, at the moment, but where, as you can probably tell, I'm, I'm actually uh, a Brit. Um, and my wife and I are moving back to Britain, um, actually at the weekend on Sunday. Um, but I, where I, I have a, a visiting professorship there at my old institution, uh, but I've also got a visiting professorship in China. Um, and I'll be there for three months from uh, mid-April, in fact. Um, till uh, October 2020, I was a full-time, full professor at a British university, University of Northampton. And I stepped down from that uh, after 25 years at that institution um, to uh, reevaluate the work that I wanted to do, um, how I wanted to earn a living, how I wanted the rest, the, the last part of my career to uh, to pan out. Uh, and so as I, I went independent um, and I'm building on about 30 years worth of, of uh, research experience uh, on, on pollinators, uh, beginning with my PhD back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and since then, I've done field work in Africa, South America, Australia, Asia, Canary Islands, and the UK as, as well, and published something around 160 research papers. Um, my first um, sole authored book came out in 2021. That was called Pollinators and Pollination, Nature and Society. And I say my, uh, my next book, uh, which is the topic of this uh, webinar, um, is out now. So that's a little bit about me. Um, let's get to the meat of, of what we're, we're talking about here birds and their interactions with flowers. This image, uh, which I'd like to start with, is the earliest European representation of the interaction between birds and flowers. And it's from something called the Florentine Codex. Uh, I'm not going to attempt the Spanish, uh, but it translates as the universal history of the things of, of New Spain, written by a, a Spanish monk. De Sahagan, um, sometime in the mid to late um, 16th century. And in the center of this image, you can see what is clearly a hummingbird feeding on a flower. Uh, if you're wondering about the hummingbird that's hanging from a tree just above it, we think it represents uh, a hummingbird going into torpor. Uh, which, of course, uh, many hummingbird species do in, in cold weather, particularly at, at high elevations. Um, so this is considered the first European representation of this interaction between birds and flowers. But what is not so widely recognized is that uh, Bernardino de Sahagun was actually using indigenous scholars and artists for the accounts. It was it was written in, in what is now Mexico. And it was indigenous scholars and artists who were who were giving him information and preparing these images. Because of course um indigenous Americans have known about interactions uh between hummingbirds and flowers for um 
probably thousands of years, probably since they, they arrived in, uh, in the Americas. And this is an example of what is really the oldest representations of birds interacting with flowers. This is from the Nazca culture uh, in what is, is now Peru. It's over a thousand years old. It's a ceramic polychrome vessel, a thing called a stirb, a stirb vessel. Um, and so I say these are the oldest known representations of bird flower interactions. Um, and I'm going to be coming back to this um, at, at the end. Because this is not actually the oldest representation of a, 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 a bird that visits flowers. Um, uh, as we'll see in a moment, hummingbirds are not the only flower visiting birds. Uh, if we go to Australia, we find um, a group of birds called honey eaters, uh, which belong to a completely different family, actually to a different order of birds. And in the north of Australia, in Arnhem Land, there are stencils of uh, what we believe are honey eaters that were made by the indigenous um, Aboriginals in, within Australia at least 9,000 years ago. And these were made by someone holding a, um, a bird against a rock uh, wall and probably blowing pigment out of their mouths um, around um, around the bird, or, or stippling it with a uh, with a, a brush. Uh, we don't know the uh, which of those techniques was was used, but this is almost certainly the oldest known representation of a of a type of bird that regularly visit flowers. I'm going to push the uh, the time scale back a, uh, some way now uh, to about 32 million years ago, and we're going back into the northern hemisphere, into um, into Germany, where you might be surprised to learn that the earliest known hummingbird fossils exist. Uh, this is work by Gerald Meyer, German paleo uh, uh, paleobiologist called Gerald Meyer. Um, and of course, hummingbirds now are restricted to to the New World, to the Americas, and to some of the uh, the offshore islands, the Caribbean, and and so on. Um, but their ancestors almost certainly evolved in Eurasia and then made the journey across to uh, to the New World. Um, and this hummingbird species, which he was named by Gerald Meyer as Eurotrochilus inexpectatus, the unexpected European hummingbird. Uh, in its um, uh, skull morphology, its beak morphology, is almost identical to some uh, extant hummingbirds now. And so this group almost certainly evolved its nectar feeding habits in, um, in the old world and then shifted over to the, to the new world. It's not the oldest example of um, interactions between uh, birds and flowers that we're aware of. Uh, for that, we have to push the, the date back even further, another 10 million years or so, to, to 47 million years ago, um, to a bird called Pumilionus. Again, this is work by, by Gerald Meyer. And in fact, this is where the, the subtitle of my book comes from an intimate 50 million year relationship. There's a little bit of artistic license there. They, they've dated these fossils at, at uh, 47 million years, but you know what's, what's three million years between, uh, between friends? Um, this is uh, a bird that has uh, the remains of pollen in its gut, um, preserved within the, within the specimen, showing that it, it uh, certainly was um, probably a nectar feeder, which, which was ingesting pollen at, at, at the same time. Um, interestingly, uh, Gerald's conclusion from this is that Pomilionis is not a hummingbird and it does not belong to any of the modern groups of flower visiting birds. And I've put my emphasis on, on his, his statement there. And um, that really gets us to the crux of, of what I want to talk about today, because our understanding of bird pollination, of flower visitation and the transference of, of pollen between flowers by birds is dominated by one single family, uh, which is the hummingbirds, the Trachylidae. Um, 
And you can get a sense of that just by going into Google Scholar and uh, looking at the number of hits that you get if you put in hummingbird or hummingbirds uh, into, into Google Scholar, something of approaching 120,000 uh, hits on, on Google Scholar. Um, if you look at the other two major groups of um, uh, flower visiting birds, uh, one of which I've already mentioned, the honey eaters, uh, which are Australasian in in distribution, uh, and the other, the, the sunbirds and spider hunters, which are African and, and Asian in, in distribution, there's an order of magnitude fewer studies published about the, about those two two groups. So much of what we think we know about relationships between flowers and birds uh, comes from, from studies of hummingbirds. However, while I was researching my book, I discovered that confirmed or suspected pollinating birds are known from at least 74 different families within the birds. That's out of, out of 253. And they belong to 11 out of 41 different orders. So the phylogenetic diversity of uh, pollinating birds or, or birds that we suspect act as pollinators um, is much, much wider than just the hummingbirds, and in fact, much wider than hummingbirds plus sunbirds plus, plus honey eaters. So what I've done with this illustration is to, is to just highlight those, um, those orders um, on this, this bird phylogeny. Um, the uh, the hummingbirds belong to the uh, down the bottom left. They belong to the Apodiformes, uh, related to the swifts. Um, uh, in fact, and so obviously they they're there on the the phylogeny. But then you have groups like the Galliformes, which include the landfowl, uh, the Charadriformes, which include gulls and shore birds. We have mouse birds there, the Coliformes, uh, hornbills and hoopoes, woodpeckers. Um, Quite a, a large number of woodpeckers visit visit flowers and act as uh, pollinators. Uh, we've got parrots um, as well, and then the the passeriformes, the passerines, or the perching birds, which include sixty percent of uh, species diversity. There's a significant number of families uh, within uh, within that uh, order as well, which which we know act as as pollinators. So let's talk about some of these in a little bit more detail. So we'll start with non-passerine groups that are known as suspected pollinators. So I mentioned the woodpeckers, something about 8% uh, of the woodpeckers are recorded as visiting flowers. Uh, this is a Cuban green uh, woodpecker uh, visiting flowers of a, uh, um, a tree in Cuba, uh, photographed by my, my friend and colleague Bo Dalskar, uh, and almost certainly pollinating that, um, uh, th those flowers. Um, then you've got the parrots, about a quarter of the parrots are known to uh, pollinate as well, uh, including some uh, a lot of Australian species as well, which pollinate banksias, uh, which have these really tough inflorescences that can withstand the depredations of, um, uh, of, of parrots. Uh, and then I mentioned the mouse birds, which belong to an order, an order of their own. They're only a small group. Uh, but very, very distinct, about a third of them. And then we've got pigeons and doves. Uh, you know, a significant number of the pigeons and doves also act as, uh, as pollinators. Uh, within the passerines themselves, I mentioned the honey eaters and, and, uh, and the sunbirds. These are pretty large families. Um, uh, and within uh, the, the passerines of the 147 families, uh, about 40% of them, uh, include known or, or suspected uh, pollinators. Um, less well known are the white white eyes, which are mainly Asian um, and African in their distribution. Another big family, 142 species, all of them, as far as we're aware, visit uh, flowers. Um, and then we've got groups like the, the the flower peckers. All of, as the name suggests, all of those uh, visit flowers. Um, and then some uh, perhaps unexpected flower visitors in some of the other families, things like the finches, which actually includes the Hawaiian honeycreepers. Uh, about 11% of those are flower visitors. 
uh, amongst the crows, 13% uh, of those species are known to be to be pollinators, including one quarter of the, the genus Corvus, uh, more than 40 species within the crows and ravens uh, uh, and so on, are, are known to, to feed on nectar. That was a review by James Fitzsimmons um, a few years ago. Um, and then we've got things like the starlings, uh, the New World warblers, tanagers and troupials and, and so on, where again, significant proportions of the, the species within those families have been shown to visit flowers in a way that suggests that they, they act as, uh, as pollinators. And then there's a whole host of really small and quite obscure families uh, where all of them are known to uh, to visit uh, flowers and act as pollinators. Uh, things like the leaf birds and the berry peckers, uh, Hawaiian honey eaters, um, the acetes, which are an interesting group uh, from Madagascar. This this uh, top image, top left image, is a yellow-bellied bellied acety, uh, which as you can see, see the, the, uh, the bill is very, very well adapted for uh, feeding on, on flowers in, in Madagascar, where it's, where it's endemic. So if we add those statistics up, what we find is that the hummingbirds represent about a quarter of all of the, the known um, uh, flower visiting and, and likely pollinating birds. Uh, some birds and honey eaters uh, between them are about a quarter. And then the other birds, those other bird groups that I described, are half uh, represent half of the uh, the diverse the species level diversity of flower visiting birds. Um, so out of about uh, eleven thousand bird species in total, something like thirteen percent are known or suspected pollinators. Um, and that uh, number is increasing all the time. Actually, as I was writing the book, uh, which started about two years ago, um, I had to keep revising the statistics, going back to the earlier chapters and revising the statistics as I, as I was uncovering examples of new species that I wasn't aware of, and even whole families that I wasn't aware of. One of the things that I argue at the, uh, in the book is that, you know, we use these widely um, um, uh, written terms or, or reproduced terms like specialist nectar feeders. Uh, we often describe the, the hummingbirds as specialist nectar feeders, even though they all include quite a significant amount of uh, insects and spiders in their diet, uh, for example. Uh, but we also use terms like opportunistic nectar feeders or generalist passerines. Um, and I strongly believe we need to reassess some of this terminology um, because many of these birds, even if they um, are not specialized for nectar feeding, uh, they, it's really important that they have nectar within their, their diet. Um, and to give you an example, uh, migratory warblers um, in the uh, the new world um, nectar is is likely to be absolutely critical to their uh, migratory movements um, every year uh, and that's currently being being studied by a project called the the songbirds as pollinators project the sap project uh, which is being coordinated by a phd researcher called carolyn coyle who's at Colorado State University. There's the, the website there if you want to take a look at it. She's she's looking at this in, in detail as to just how important uh, nectar and pollen is for, uh, for these migratory birds. What does all that bird diversity mean for flower diversity? Well, all of the birds... Uh, all of the flowers that I'm showing uh, showing you on these, these images here um, are bird pollinated um, and they're specialized for bird pollination uh, but they're pollinated by five different orders and eight different families of birds so morphologically the flowers look very very different so so if we're you know if we can agree that to a large extent the morphology the phenotype of flowers um, is driven by evolution to to their pollinators, and as you can see, the flowers themselves have a, a range of different colours and shapes, and and uh, also nectar attributes and um, and so forth. Um, they don't all fit into um, what we think of as being the the general um, 
pollen, what's termed the pollination syndrome of, of bird pollinated flowers. And it's something I'll come back to in a, uh, in a little while. So, so I calculated for the book that I think at least 20,000 plant species are whole, or, excuse me, wholly or in part bird pollinated. Uh, that's about 6% of the flowering plant species. If we think that there's about 300 to 350,000 species of, of flowering plants. And again, if we map bird pollination onto the phylogeny of the flowering plants, um, we find it's relatively rare, but phylogenetically widespread. Um, sorry, and, and, and many of the flowers don't fit, fit that, that classic model of, of, of ornithophily, which is this bird pollination syndrome. So, so if you've done any reading about um, bird pollination, you'll have come across this term, ornithophily. And again, one of the things I highlight in my book is that the term is actually used in in two different ways uh, and you see two different um, um, uses within within the scientific literature um, and those two different uses only partially con converge um, and that first meaning actually refers to the act of pollination by birds so so we say the flower was ornithophilus or in, in this plant genus ornithophily is common uh, meaning that bird pollination is common but the second way it's used is that the words refer to a set of flower traits often red coloration tubular uh, large amounts of di dilute nectar that we associate with some classical ideas about bird pollination which are mainly driven by the hummingbird literature actually um, so those plants on the left uh, uh, here, uh, which are two South African species, have a lot of the classic traits of ornithophily, the red coloration and, and large amounts of dilute nectar. Uh, so they're ornithophilus in the second uh, definition, but they're actually butterfly pollinated. Those two plants on the, on the right are ornithophilus according to that first definition, uh, but they certainly don't have the, the classical traits that we we, ex uh, we ex uh, might expect. Um, so both those usages are are acceptable, but they're not synonymous. Um, and I think what what some some of us researchers have been guilty of of using these terms rather loosely without really defining what we what we mean by them. Um, so that was a little bit of a sort of a side about the about the terminology. If we uh, then map bird pollination at, the, uh, on, at an order level on the, uh, the phylogeny of, of the flowering plants, we find that of the uh, 64 flowering plant orders, more than half contain species where bird pollination is uh, confirmed or, or suspected. Um, and there's there's some patterns, some phylogenetic patterns within within this uh, phylogeny. Um, for example, uh, it seems to be absent as as far as we can tell from the earliest diverging groups, things like the the magnolias and and so on. Um, and there's something of a, a clumpy distribution um, within the uh, the remaining orders, though that's not been uh, properly statistically tested. But otherwise, there's no obvious phylogenetic structure. Bird pollination is widespread across the uh, the flowering plants. Um, and that's been uh, shown at a, at a, um, a, a lower uh, taxonomic or phylogenetic level as well, where we find at a, at a tribal level, for example, if we consider the, the milkweed and dogbane family, the Apocinaceae, which is a family that I've, I've worked on for many years, we find bird pollination uh, just restricted to three tribes within that, uh, that family. Uh, and it, it, it pops up in, in different places within the, uh, within, within the, within the family. Uh, likewise, in family Loisaceae, it's it's present in uh, some genera, but but not in in others. Uh, and then, if we look at the genus Iachroma, uh, uh, worked by Stacy uh, Smith and and colleagues, we see that bird pollination po uh, is is repeatedly lost and gained throughout the um, 
the course of the evolution of that uh, of that genus. And that's been found in, in other genera as well. Things like the penstemons, for example, quite a large genus, uh, or, or actually several um, genera, which are lumped together into this one, one informal name, the, the penstemons. Um, 290 species within there, um, and work by Paul Mil Wilson and Calacastianos and, and so on, um, suggested that there might be as many as two dozen shifts between bee and hummingbird pollination within that um, within that group. And um, it begs an interesting question. Um, that there are no shortages of bees in the world. Um, some species are declining. We're losing um, uh, some species of bumblebees, for, uh, for example, some of the, the other species. There's endless numbers of, of honeybees. We're certainly not losing those. But there's no shortage of, of bees in the world uh, and, and other kinds of insect pollinators. So why should these flowers shift to bird pollination? What's the advantage of, of evolving bird pollination over pollination by, by insects? Um, and this is not a trivial question, actually, because if we look at the evolution of the flowering plants and the evolution of uh, pollination systems um, over over that time period, um, you go back into the, the late Jurassic, early Cretaceous for the origin of the, the flowering plants, and the earliest flowering plants we know were insect pollinated, uh, as were many of the uh, now extinct groups of, of gymnosperms that, that predate uh, the evolution of the, the flowering plants. So insect pollination has been a constant throughout the evolution of, uh, of the flowering plants from the earliest Cretaceous all the way through to the, the present day. Um, although the earliest true bir birds uh, evolved in the middle of the Jurassic, modern birds really evolve until... Um, the end of the Cretaceous, and as I said earlier, hummingbirds are uh, about 30 million years ago. So there's a lot of evolutionary time during which relationships between insects and flowering plants became established. So why did some of these groups of, of, uh, of plants switch over to, to birds? Um, and there's um, a few different hypotheses there. Um, one uh, hypothesis is called the increased gene flow hypothesis, uh, which states that birds typically fly longer distances than insects and they, they disperse the pollen further and they can connect together otherwise isolated populations of plants. Um, and uh, work by Nathan Muchala and, and colleagues um, in, in South America has um, certainly shown some evidence that, that that's the case. Um, but one of the problems uh, there is that um, reproductive isolation between populations is usually one of the prerequisites for the evolution of new species. But here we're saying that birds actually hold species together, hold populations of, of species together. So it should actually have the opposite effect. It shouldn't be uh, promoting speciation within, um, within those those groups. So I think, think there's a there's a, a problem there in, in that regard. Um, uh, and, so, and in fact, adaptation to hummingbird pollination is associated with reduced uh, diversification in uh, in the, uh, the penstemons. Um, so so there's there's I think there's more work needs to be done on on uh, on untangling that particular hypothesis. The other hypothesis that's, that's been promoted um, is called the reduced grooming hypothesis. And it goes something like this, that, that uh, insects and particularly bees actively groom pollen from their bodies um, as they're foraging, uh, which reduces the likelihood of that pollen then going on and fathering an offspring in, um, uh, in a, on another plant. Uh, whereas the, the idea is that birds uh, don't do that. Um, so... 
so much. Hummingbirds don't do that. But actually, again, there's there's far too few tests of that idea. And there are birds that will uh, flight groom and, and they'll wash themselves, and they'll feather dust, and they'll bill wipe and, and so on, uh, all of which will remove pollen from, from their bodies. Uh, so again, I think we need more work on uh, to, to really test that hypothesis properly. Um, and one of the one of the things I think that's hampering um, our understanding of um, why pollination by birds evolves is that quite often we're looking at these um, extreme adaptations of flowers that are, that are that are pollinated by birds. Let's say this this archetypical hummingbird pollinated red flowers, uh, tubular corollas, uh, abundant nectar. Uh, but work by some of my Brazilian colleagues has, has shown that um, actually in in um, in some Brazilian grasslands, for instance, uh, hummingbirds will will pollinate a wide range of different flowers, many of which do not um, uh, fit this this typical bird pollination. Um, syndrome and I'm, I'm quoting myself from from the book here if you, you'll indulge me one of the things I say in the book is that you know we can look at a flower and we can often say that a particular flower is bird pollinated but we can't say with certainty that a, another flower is not just based on the the morphology of the flower uh, and in fact uh, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that but I'll if you go back to it and, and have a look at this when uh, when you see the recording, you can uh, you can have a look at that uh, that uh, that particular paper. Um, just checking the checking the time here. Um, one of the problems I think that we we've had historically with with trying to understand bird pollination uh, is that a lot of the uh, the early work in particular. Uh, going back into the 19th century here was done by Europeans who really didn't understand bird pollination. And um, there's this fantastic quote from uh, uh, a Dutch researcher called Bastian Moose in, in, in the 1960s in his book, The Story of Pollination, where he writes that in all Europe, there are no birds which are interested in nectar or pollen for food. As a result, there's always been a tremendous emphasis on insects in European pollination work, and the birds have been downright neglected. Uh, now, he was right in one respect. The birds were neglected by European researchers you know, right into the, into the 20th century, but he was wrong about there being no bird-pollinated plants in, uh, in Europe. And in fact, it wasn't until... Uh, the early 21st century and work by a Spanish uh, researcher, Ana Ortega Olivencia, who showed that uh, there are set, there are in fact several specialized bird pollinated plants in, um, in Europe, but they're not pollinated by the kinds of birds that we might expect. They're pollinated by non what we might term non-specialist tits and warblers and, and, and so on. Um, and these are plants that, um, in some cases, were named by Linnaeus in the 18th century. They're, they're well-known plants. Likewise, the birds were named by Linnaeus in the 18th century. Uh, and, and we've known about those for a long time. But the actual interactions between those species had never really been been considered. They'd never been looked at. And, and one of the things I talk about in the, in the book is that it's a, I think it's a nice example of sort of blinkered science where... Um, because European researchers didn't expect to find bird pollinated flowers there, they didn't bother looking for them. Um, and, but actually, you know, uh, going back to what I was saying about um, nectar and pollen being uh, a requirement for many of these these birds, um, if we consider um, uh, uh, blue tits in uh, Europe, in Britain, for example, uh, blue tits we know that can obtain all of their daily energy requirements early in uh, in the spring by foraging on on salix catkins willow catkins for three or three or four hours um 
But what's never been been looked at, and again, I think it's an example of kind of blinkered science, what's never been looked at is whether these birds are actually effective pollinators of those uh, those willows. And I wish somebody would go out and do and do this this work. Uh, as you can see from this uh, this blue tit uh, here that's been misnested, uh, its face is absolutely covered in pollen. Um, and I think I, if I were were a gambling man, I'd I'd be willing to stake. Uh, money on on the, the those birds being effective pollinators which takes us back to uh almost to where we started um this ceramic vessel from the nazca culture i i photographed this in a, an art museum in denmark back in 2018 and i actually used the image in my first book um pollinators and pollination nature and society and i just described it as being you know the the earliest um representation of, a, of birds visiting flowers um but it was only when i was researching my my most recent book that i really started to look at this image in detail because if you look really really closely at those birds what you find is that each of those birds is different they differ in their plumage in their tail length tail coloration in the length of their uh, bills and in the curvature of the bills they're all different species so whoever was the artist who was painting this vessel uh, more than a thousand years ago was more than just an artist i think they were um, at the very least a, a careful observer of nature uh, and arguably a, um, a taxonomist um, interestingly, the flower um, has seems to have eight petals, and there are very few flowers in South and Central America with with sets of eight petals. So we don't know what that flower is is supposed to represent. Um, it might just be a, a symbolic representation of flowers, um, but certainly the uh, the birds are definitely all different. Um, so I'm going to leave you with this, this quote, um, which actually is, is a quote that I start the, the book with. Um, and it's by an Indian uh, researcher who, who was very active in the 30s and the, and the 40s um, uh, called Salim Ali, uh, who, who was known as the Birdman of, of India. And he was really one of the founding um, scientists of, of ornithology in, uh, in India. And in um, uh, an article in the Journal of the Bombay Natural History Society from 1932, he writes that while it is but rarely that an ornithologist also possesses sufficient competence in botany to be able to conduct research of this nature, meaning bird flower interaction, um, bird pollination, uh, without the aid of a specialist and vice versa, an intimate cooperation between the two is clearly indicated for obtaining optimum results um and i wholly agree with that i think ornithologists and botanists need to be working together much more closely to understand these interactions um but also we need to be working with paleontologists to understand the deep time evolution of uh, these relationships we need to be working with molecular biologists to understand uh, phylogenetic relationships between these different groups. We need to work with, with natural products chemists who can tell us about um, uh, how, how flower coloration evolves um, uh, and the fact that some bird flowers are, are scented and, and, and others aren't requires us to work with uh, uh, those chemists and physiologists, bird physiologists um, as well. Um, science is becoming out ever more a um, a cooperative and collaborative um, exercise between multiple different different disciplines. Uh, so I think what what Salim Ali was writing in the nineteen thirties uh, is is truer now than than ever. Um, Hopefully that's interested you. I thank you for listening. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you uh, that you might have. Um, look out for the book, um, please. Uh, you know, if you read it, let me know what you, what you think. There's contact information on my my website there. Um, I'm always happy to uh, to chat with people about that. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, we greatly appreciate it.
So uh, for our TIES webinars, they're mostly watched by teachers and students. And that last bit you said is leads to our first question really well. What advice do you have for high school students who want to go into studying bird and flower coevolution? Because you just mentioned that you need chemists and bird physiologists, but like at the high school level, what maybe classes should they be taking or what type of professors should they be reaching out to? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, biology is the founding uh, the, the, the founding science there. Uh, and I, th I think, you know, if, if we're thinking in terms of exercises that high school students can can do, I mean, depending on, on where you are in, in North America, uh, there are always hummingbirds moving through and on, on migration through through different parts of, of the USA and, and into Canada, even into southern Alaska, for example. Um, so certainly uh, it's possible to, to get students out there and, and um, studying hummingbirds. Um, one way to approach it is to use these artificial nectar feeders and to look at behavior of, of hummingbirds on, on the nectar feeders. Um, but that's not without its, its problems. Um, you've got to make sure those hummingbird feeders are regularly cleaned. Um, uh, the other way to do it is, is to plant um, appropriate flowers around a, a high school campus um, and, and look out for the behavior of the, of the birds there. Um, but also to look out for other kinds of, kinds of birds. Um, it might also be worth I mentioned the, the Songbirds as Pollinators project, uh, Carolyn uh, Coyle's project. Uh, it'd be worth um, getting in touch with, with Carolyn about, about that because that is aimed at being a citizen science project. And essentially what she's, she's doing is asking um, uh, mainly amateur naturalists, uh, amateur ornithologists who are mist netting birds and banding them, uh, when they miss net the, the birds to actually take swabs of pollen from their bodies and send them send them back. So if, so if local high schools can link up with local bird groups, uh, there'd be opportunity for for high school students to take to take part in that. Yeah, I think that's a kind of an easy connection to have a little gardening club, or start a gardening club with your high school, and then I'm sure Audubon and other nature centers would love to be involved with youth because all these organizations the membership is getting older and older and they need to recruit people who are like-minded yeah. debbie yeah. allen a cfi employee says i leave this lecture with the desire to learn more i will be sharing <laughs> to all the gardening fans in my life who like me may not fully appreciate the relationship between birds and flowers very good. Thank you, Debbie. I, I consider my job done. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I succeeded. <laughs> and then uh, I think the last question of the day, because you got to get going and so do we, is for students or grad students who want to work in a foreign country, what advice do you have for them? Sh should they have explored that foreign country before they move there? As you were mentioning all the countries you've been working in and out of, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been incredibly fortunate in that regard. Uh, and uh, but but that that fortune is a, is partly predicated a, a good deal predicated on working with local scientists there. Um, so um, you know, working, reaching out to people who are doing the kind of research that um, I'm interested in and looking at opportunities to raise funding to be able to um, to actually go out and and um, uh, and do that work with them. Um, and likewise, I've, I've had the, the opposite thing happened. I've had Brazilian researchers, Mexican researchers, African researchers, researchers from, from Pakistan and Bangladesh and China come over to visit me in uh, in Britain and work with, with me there. So um, in ten, it probably still takes place, but less so. But we used to call 
um, the idea of scientists just going in and, and doing a piece of work in a country and then leaving again with all the data and all the specimens. We used to refer to that as parachute scientists, science. The scientists would literally parachute in and then, and then leave it. That's changing, fortunately. We're, we're doing more and more work with, with local scientists um, on the ground and vice versa. I mean, it's, it is, a, I'd say, a, a, a two-way exchange. Um, and I think that's that's absolutely vital. So, so to any students who are interested in in you know traveling and and working in in other countries, I'd say you know find the names of the scientists who are doing the kind of work that you're you're interested in, reach out to them, um, ask them about opportunities for internships or travel grants and and so on. And there's there's organizations like uh, Ecological Society of America and, and so on who can facilitate some of some of that. All right, very good. I know you're getting a taxi in yeah. 20 minutes, so this will be the last question yeah, from okay. Tom. That's, that's Any yeah. data on flowering and bird migration mismatch due to climate change? Really, really good question, Tom. Um, not so far. It's it's not happening so far. But this this is a, a discussion I I have with uh, uh, with colleagues who are interested in climate change and and how it's affecting plant pollinator interactions. I, I have this discussion with them with quite a lot. Um, the, there's there is a certain level of robustness built into these to these systems. Plant flowering and uh, insect and bird movements often are um cued to the same kind of climatic um stimuli could be temperature um could be um other other kinds of climatic cues shifts in weather patterns and and so on uh and so as 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 flowers shift shift their 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 blooming time quite often insects and birds will will shift their their um emergence time or their or their um arrival time um, so there's limited evidence that that's happening at the moment, but we are at the start of um, a fair, what is potentially going to be a fairly extreme um, experiment that's happening at the moment with climate change. Whether the, the climatic envelopes are going to shift to such an extent that flowering time and, and, and bird movement or insect emergence become totally dis disaggregated or significantly disaggregated because they're experiencing uh temperatures and weather conditions that they they've never experienced in the past remains to, to be seen it's certainly something that that i know a lot of group of research groups are interested in something that we really have to um uh to to take seriously yeah all right well thank you so much for everyone who attended this live and also thank you jeff for a great presentation we have one more on the books right now which is march 19th and we encourage everyone to join there and you can tell your colleagues that this will be posted by monday on our youtube channel so uh once again uh thank you everyone and thank you jeff and debbie says safe travels thank home you. thank you debbie thank you bye everyone Thank you. Bye-bye.